I ripped this test at like 11.30. Is there any chance that you get mm. Mm.
understand that it's snowboard and stuff. Like, yeah, that, that's not in the car, but. <laughs> I guess I gotta get you home, right? No, just go to work. And then I have to come home to pick up my birthday. And then that's, that's and then you're coming back here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then how are you getting home? I'm not going home. You're staying here again tonight? I am not coming. I'm going to Bath's after. Bath's just gonna pick you up. I'm going to Bath's to Bath. Oh, for some. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're resuming lectures. I, I want to uh, know whether um, you have any questions about uh, the past lecture or about um, the, um, the course or any questions at all uh, arising from last time. Okay, so today uh, I want to continue the narrative that I was developing last time, which is centered around the consolidation of the, uh, what we call the sovereign territorial state. And we saw an example of that in Spain and I was developing a similar narrative with respect to uh, England and France. Uh, the three of these states became the uh, models of a, a territorial state in which uh, you have a monarchy and a centralized government and a standing army and administrative apparatus, um, the control over the church vested in the monarchy. And uh, these become the major, major players of European politics. And indeed, in terms of uh, European expansion overseas, uh, they also uh, are predominant. 
so I was uh, I looked at Spain. Now I'm looking at France and England. Um, and what you can say um, is that um, these two countries, like Spain, in the 15th suffer, uh, century, suffered from the violence of the feudal aristocracy. This had been a problem all through the Middle Ages and had become particularly acute during the late Middle Ages, for reasons I don't want to uh, go into at this moment. But there was, uh, in all, of, uh, all over Europe, as a matter of fact, especially Western Europe, uh, the nobles were running wild. And uh, we saw how Ferdinand and Isabella brought them under control. Of course, the nobles considered to be central. And they were the ruling class. Um, but the monarchy, in a way, forced them into obedience and basically um, sort of utilized their violence by creating these uh, military establishments, uh, uh, the standing army and so on, uh, which uh, used their uh, talent, uh, their talents for, um, for violence in an organized way. Um, and the same thing more or less happened in England and France. Um, so uh, uh, to narrate this in France, uh, an alliance developed between the middle class of the towns, the wealthy merchants uh, in the towns and the monarchy. And uh, this alliance, because the middle class wanted peace so that they could do business, um, involved basically um, a deal in which in return for the establishment of a permanent tax system, which could give the monarchy um, steady revenues, uh, the king basically created a standing army. Uh, it first composed largely of noble cavalry, organizing the violence of the noble, but these people were now paid and they were in the service of the monarchy. And in addition to that, the king created an artillery train, that is to say, the cannon, 80, 100, 120 cannon, uh, which could, uh, these cannon could uh, destroy any castle of uh, a um, upstart noble, a noble who refused the obedience of the king. And so, with this uh, combination of a standing army and artillery train, uh, the French king was able to impose violent, uh, sorry, peace, more or less, on the kingdom of France. Now in England, same thing, except um, that um, no standing army was created. Instead, the, because uh, England was an island, instead there was a royal navy, and also there was an artillery train. Um, and this uh, more or less established um, the same pattern of, um, of um, sort of peace on the English, um, uh, the, the English um, uh, feudal nobility. So that's the basis, this alliance between the middle class and the, um, and the king. And you'll note that by uh, putting an emphasis on the middle class in the case of France and England, um, in contrast to Spain, where the middle class was, it existed and it was, it was part of the process of consolidation of the Spanish state. But for reasons that I've explained, the middle class in, in Spain was never as powerful. And of course, when they got rid of their Jews, that seriously weakened the middle class in, in Spain. Well, taking these things together, and if you add up the fact that uh, the king now had the resources to create um, a royal bureaucracy, including a kind of um, a tax bureau, uh, the kings were now able to create law courts with, which could impose law on the, uh, the people of the kingdom. 
with the creation of what we call the royal court. That is to say, the, uh, the king in his palace or palaces had um, this uh, immense uh, entourage of servants, particularly drawn from the nobility. When you consider all that, plus the fact that in, in France and England, just as in Spain, the kings moved to bring the, uh, politically, to bring the church, which was the single richest institution in society, under the control of the monarchy. When you add that, um, you can see that a territorial state is establishing itself in Spain and uh, in Spain, in France, and England. And of course, one of the things we should realize that uh, we, uh, you have studied the development of capitalism. Capitalism requires um, uh, a, what we call a, a, a national market. Uh, uh, it requires the unification of the separate towns and territories into a single market. And it was the state which established the framework for the establishment of a national market for the development of capitalism in all of these uh, places, uh, especially in France and England. Is there any question that you have about what I've said? Um, so having said that, uh, I want to, um, to put on the screen a map of Europe in 1500. Here we see uh, Europe in 1500, more or less. So uh, you could, uh, looking at the map, you see England, and England is more or less a unified territory uh, in 1500. And likewise, you can say um, France, likewise. Well, it's all in blue. Now, we look at Spain. This map happened, here's Portugal off to the left. You look at Spain, well, the main area is Castile, uh, the secondary area is Aragon, but um, they, in, in fact, through the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, and especially by the establishment of the Inquisition, which is the first national institution in modern Spain, the, the, uh, the Inquisition, uh, you can see that uh, these three states are more or less unified. But if we look eastward, we look at uh, sort of uh, the Netherlands, or what's today Belgium and Holland, but especially Germany and also Italy. What we see is uh, no unification whatsoever. Uh, no, um, these territories remain just as they were during the Middle Ages. They never got unified. Instead, what, well, there was a Holy Roman Emperor in Germany, but uh, he didn't have the powers of the King of France or the King of Spain. He was a titular uh, head uh, of Germany, but he didn't have real power. And in Italy, the Italy was divided um, into um, five major principalities and maybe a dozen minor principalities. And uh, particularly, of course, important is the principality in the center of Italy, namely the papal state. The popes were princes. They were the religious head of the Catholic Church, but they had a state in central Italy. Uh, so Italy is also the divided. But what we can say is that um, the smaller states of Germany and Italy, and here I'm naming some of them. We have Saxony, Bavaria, Mecklenburg, Hesse, I'm just dropping names here, the Rhenish Palatinate. And in Italy, the Ferrara, Savoy, the Papal State, um, but also some of these what we call city states, 
That is to say, in Italy, there were uh, in Milan, in Venice, in Florence, where the merchants were all powerful, the city of Florence, the city of Venice, the city of Milan, governed by merchants, uh, that uh, they, these uh, entities also created states. And so um, they imitated the kings of France, Spain, and England in this respect. So you have these smaller states uh, all through Central Europe, from Germany down into Italy. This is the way it worked. Do you have any questions about what I've just said? It's just rather complicated. I'm basically giving you the, the uh, sort of basic architecture of Europe after 1500. Um, but we could also mention that uh, you see Denmark up here, you see Sweden here, they too became, they, they, were, they were economically insignificant, but they also consolidated their monarchies uh, during this period. So having uh, said all this, I wanted to say uh, 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 three basic things uh, about this uh, sort of political setup that I've explained. First of all, you should understand that uh, yes, I said something about the alliance between the middle class and the king as being central to this process that I've described. But you should understand that the nobles, for all their violence and their destructiveness, they remain the ruling class in all of the countries that I've mentioned, except for these uh, merchant republics in Italy. Everywhere else, it was the nobles who continued on the land, which the land after all was the, the whole basis of uh, the economy still in 1500. The nobles were the landlords. And so the nobles, uh, they, um, they remained the ruling class right down to the French Revolution in 1789. It's only with the French Revolution, we can say that the middle class comes to power. But right through, and maybe uh, England and the Netherlands are, are um, exceptions, but for the most part, the, the nobles are the ruling class. And you could see this even within the structure of these new states, because yes, there were standing army, or in the case of England, the Royal Navy. Yes, there was the established church and so on. Um, but all of the senior offices in these two fundamental institutions, the military and the church, um, they were the exclusive monopoly of the nobles. So the nobles were the landlords, but the two central institutions, the, uh, the church and the army, remained in the hands of this landlord class. And also we should uh, reiterate, the kings created courts, royal courts, huge entourages, servants, palaces, and so on, where the king basically conducted his business. But surrounding him were thousands of noblemen. We call these people who were these noblemen who uh, sort of lived at the court, courtiers, courtiers, people who lived at the court, C-O-U-R-T-I-E-R-S. Um, so that was the essential structure. Um, and the second point is that each of these territorial states, we can call them sovereign territorial states, because the king was the source of all authority. There was a centralized authority for the first time since the time of the Roman emperors, way back in, in antiquity. These sovereign territorial states each of them was the rival of the other states. Each of them was the rival of the other states. In other words, what I'm saying is that basically there was um, certainly the internal anarchy that had marked the Middle Ages came to an end, but the political anarchy at the state level continued because the King of France was the enemy of the King of England uh, both of them were enemies of Spain, and 
all of the other smaller states sort of a revol uh, as kind of satellites revolved around these three main states. So you have a state of permanent war between these states going on. In fact, between 1500 and 1789, there wasn't a year where there wasn't a war going on between one or another of these states in Europe. And as part of this process, of course, war making, which is of course very important to the nobles, uh, uh, the, uh, a kind of state, what, uh, what is described by historians as a balance of power existed in Europe. That is a state, all of these states were jockeying for position and power and they made alliances. If one state got too strong, well, two other states uh, combined and offset the power of the other states, a kind of law known as the balance of power existed. Illustration, Spain was the most powerful state. So the French and the English tended to ally themselves with one another against Spain in order to offset the power of Spain. That's an example of this balance of power. Are there any questions about um, um, what I've said? Okay, very good. Now, in France and Spain, sorry, in France and England, during uh, the, sixth, the first part of the 16th century, uh, there were two dynasties, these, uh, the, the kings, uh, that is to say families that ruled. In England, it was the Tudor family in the, in the 16th century. In France, it was the Valois king who ruled. And the two, I just mentioned, the two most significant of these uh, kings in England, of course, it's the, the famous Henry VIII, uh, and you see his dates. Um, and in France, there was a king, um, Francis I. He ruled during the, uh, and uh, was the uh, territorial monarch in France in the first part of the 16th century. They were the main rivals. They were constantly at war with Charles V, uh, because Charles V threatened them. And their opposition to Charles uh, played a big role, especially the French, in basically undermining the ambition of Charles V to become the ruler, the new Roman emperor, the new ruler of Europe. Now, uh, to conclude this uh, uh, sort of description of the politics of the, uh, the emerging politics of this period, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about war and warfare um, during the early modern period. Now, I've made a point of stressing the fact that uh, war was perpetual during this period. Uh, these new uh, territorial states were either at war or preparing for war right through the period between 1500 and 1789. Um, and I want to say Europe is warlike. Uh, it develops out of this warriors, uh, warrior aristocracies of the Middle Ages. War is a permanent institution in Europe. And we see even today, the war, the, the, the war is the fundamental principle of Western civilization. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, the, so you have this, uh, the nobles, that's the, the, basically their profession, war. Uh, but over time, uh, as we'll see um, a little bit later, um, the kings realized that the development of their economy in order to serve in order to carry on war, you need, uh, you need money. Um, and so uh, they eventually realized that, hey, we need to develop our internal economy and we have to get colonies overseas in order to carry on these wars. War for colonies becomes an, an important aspect. 
So what I'm saying that these wars, which initially had the character of basically of a, uh, of a kind of a perpetuation of the wars of the Middle Ages, gradually the wars develop a kind of commercial aspect to them. Uh, certainly by the end of the 17th century, 18th century, yes, the nobles are still there, they're fighting and so on there, the military commanders, the kings have a sort of a very traditional attitude. They're simply, the, they're in command of the armies and so on. But there is a, increasingly, especially in the case of the Spaniards and above all the, the French and the English, they begin to wage commercial war, wars for colony, especially, um, all over the world. Now, war is a very expensive proposition. A very, uh, it's certainly the, I would think, the major uh, expenditure of the Canadian government. And if you're talking about the American government, my God, the, the, the United States spends more money on uh, its military machine than all other countries on earth put together. So war, and that was true really from the 16th century onward. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit. Now, in the 16th century, France was the major rival of Spain. And if we look at France in 1525, when Francis I was on the throne, he had an army of 25,000 men, standing army of 25,000 men. That's, that's big. But a um, hundred and say um, a century and a half or two centuries later, the king's name was Louis XIV, the guy who built the palace of Versailles. Uh, he was the greatest of the French kings, Louis XIV. We'll speak about him later. But um, he had an army of 400,000 men, 400,000 men. Now that costs a lot of men, a, lo a lot of money. Francis I, 25,000 men. Louis XIV, at the end of the 17th century, 400,000 men. His army was bigger than the army of the Roman Empire. So there you are. Um, and uh, secondly, in order to sort of, uh, uh, in terms of establish these armies, uh, you needed, uh, of course, a lot of cannons, field cannons, field artillery, but also in terms of defending fortifications, fortified places. You needed literally thousands of cannons. That's very expensive. Um, secondly, uh, um, they're developed, especially in Spain, France, and England, not to speak of uh, the low countries, huge navies, because the warfare increasingly, as I said, these were wars of commerce, wars of trade. Uh, you needed large navies. For example, Spain in 1588, a special date, had a navy of 120 warships, 120 to 130 warships. And the English navy was almost as large. Likewise, the French were developing a large navy. So again, hugely expensive. And finally, these armies, um, because uh, warfare required an increasing amount of discipline, uh, uh, by the end of the 16th century, what we call a sort of um, the volley, that is to say the firing of muskets by large number of men simultaneously, and then uh, volleying, uh, reloading, the whole process of volleying and reloading these large armies uh, the, in the field with their muskets, that required a, a whole lot of drill. The, to, you had to develop an organization and a discipline, and you had to supply logistically these large armies, again, a very large 
amount of money uh, was required. So what I'm driving out here, besides describing the development of these militaries, is the need for more and more money by these states who are fighting one another. And this whole process is described as the military revolution, the military revolution in these early modern states. Um, with these, the, uh, the king's um, drive for revenue to develop these military establishments is called the military revolution. Does anybody have any questions about what I've said? Okay, so um, I'm, uh, I want to say that these uh, military establishments and the constant wars were extremely damaging. These armies invaded uh, the, uh, the territory of their rivals. And when they came in, they would destroy everything. Not always, but there was constant devastation. Whole territories, whole areas were devastated. And the poor people, the merchants, uh, the ordinary people, the merchants, and above all, the common people, the peasants, suffered this devastation. Moreover, it was these people who paid the increasingly heavy taxes to support this military establishment. So all of this was very damaging to ordinary people. On the other hand, by the end of the 16th century, these states, the kings and their advisors realized that in order to um, carry on this kind of activity, in order to gain the money that they needed, that they just couldn't simply continue to drain the economic life of their territory. No, they realized that they had to develop um, trade and manufacturing in order to, they had to promote economic growth in order to carry on this kind of warfare. And so from the end of the 16th century, the territorial monarchies and the various states in Europe began to systematically try to develop their economy. They actually gave subsidies to manufacturers. They imposed tariffs on um, goods entering uh, from other country, uh, other states. Um, they established colonies where there were natural resources or other things that they could exploit. And this policy of state-directed uh, economic development, which starts at the end of the 16th century, is called mercantilism. It's the opposite of free trade. No, it's state-directed development. The state is supervising the development of an economy. And this economy is a capitalist economy. The capitalist economy develops in all of these states under the supervision of the state. Um, the idea of a free market and so on only develops at the end of the 18th century. Before that, it's all state-directed economic development and it's known as mercantilism. Any questions about what I've said? Okay, um, so, uh, yes. Um, now, I'm turning now in a completely different direction because instead of discussing politics and, if you like, the relationship between politics and economic life, I'm now going to talk about um, the cultural life of Europe at the beginning of the 16th, well, uh, uh, well, centered around the, the beginning of the 16th century. Um, and when we talk about this, um, we're talking about um, what we call the Renaissance, the culture of this period. 
is known as the Renaissance. Why is it known as the Renaissance? Because um, Renaissance, if you look at the word, Renaissance, it literally means rebirth. And the culture of this period was all about reviving the culture of the Romans and the Greeks. <laughs> In the minds of the um, you know, the sort of the educated people who, who lived at that time, um, the Greeks and the Romans were the height of human culture, human civilization. And the dream of the Europeans uh, was uh, basically, could they return to the culture of the Romans and the Greeks? This is where uh, the, the great figures were Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, maybe you know some of these names from the ancient world. They tried to study the, the manuscripts that were left. Some of them survived. All of these thinkers from the ancient world discovered this philosophy. So Plato, uh, Seneca, Cicero, uh, sort of study the historical works, study the poetry of the great uh, Roman and Greek authors. So the whole period is an attempt to recover the culture of the ancient world. That's why they themselves referred to this period as the Renaissance, getting back, re, uh, 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 restarting the culture. And the people who were uh, foremost in promoting this Renaissance were known as humanists. They studied the humanities, so they were called humanists, and um, that was their principal activity. Now, um, I want to say something about uh, having said that, that that's the sort of basic um, uh, movement of culture in the period that we're discussing. Uh, I want to say something about the meaning of 1500. That is to say, what's going on in Europe at this time. Because I've, I've in terms of my uh, lectures, I've talked about um, these, the consolidation of these territorial states. I've talked about the emergent power of the middle class. I've talked about the development of the, sail the ocean-going sailing vessels. I've talked about the development of standing armies equipped with rifles and cannon. Uh, but we should also mention uh, the fact that um, we have the invention basically of the clock and of printing. The printed book is more or less comes in at this period, slightly before, but we can say that. Well, people were aware by 1500, hey, the times are really changing. We're different from the Middle Ages. Um, and a sense of the modern began slowly to develop. People, some people began to talk about modern time. Some even timidly say, we're making a little bit of progress. Uh, they, they, they had this sense that their own times were changing. Now, um, the term that's used to describe the sort of overall sort of sense of the times is called the spirit of the times, or as it's said in German, this is a common term which is even used by English speaking people, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, Zeit means time and Geist means spirit. The spirit of the times, that's the, the phrase in German or the word, zeitgeist. The zeitgeist actually changed right before people's eyes in and around 1500. And we're talking about the Renaissance too, that's part of it. Um, so there were, what, what I'm trying to get at is that there was a sense that qualitatively, the times really were mutating. There was a change, uh, which we call uh, for short now the Renaissance. And all of these 
the, the appearance of the state, the growing significance of the middle class, the printed book, guns and cannon, um, uh, the appearance of this new um, humanist Renaissance culture, um, a change in the zeitgeist, modern times begin. Modern times really has a significance. 1500 really means something. It's not arbitrary, is what I'm saying. And I would, uh, uh, as a parenthesis, I would say, there is a sense today that we are living in new time. This is not, the times that we're living are, let's, uh, I'll use the phrase, postmodern. This is no longer the 20th century. Something new is happening, for good or for ill, as we live here. Uh, the zeitgeist is visibly changing right in front of us. We feel it. And that's uh, more or less the way people felt around 1500. Uh, but of course, um, their view was optimistic and our view is pessimistic. Even the sort of idea of progress uh, in our own day has come into, into a question. Uh, people are, well, uh, we, could, we could go back we could be we could be destroyed entirely. Uh, there's a sense of doom that hangs over mankind uh, at the present time, um, and um, so um, this uh, idea that history really changes it's real. Does anybody have any questions about or they want to say something about this? So. Who were the humanists? Well, as a matter of fact, the roots of humanism go back actually to the 14th century. And where? Where did it start? It didn't start amongst these, um, these kings, monarchs, and these emergent states. It actually started in Italy, which was the richest country in Europe in the late Middle Ages. Italy was uh, was the um, because Italy was here. We have it here. I said it was divided, but these Italian merchants were in direct communication with the Middle East and Asia, and so in Italy. In the late Middle Ages, uh, the merchants and bankers and manufacturers of Italy in uh, Venice, in Milan, um, uh, in some of the lesser cities, but above all in Florence, the city of Florence was, uh, we can say, the richest of the these um, what we call Italian city-states in Florence. And uh, the merchants in these cities began to patronize what we call the humanists. And the, the, the founders of this movement were three figures who lived in the 14th century. Um, the poet Dante, the poet Petrarch, and the storyteller Boccaccio, they were the founders of this movement uh, we, we call the Renaissance. They were the ones who had the idea that real culture lay with the Roman and Greeks, and we have to go back to that culture. And um, they were, they became famous all over Italy and beyond as uh, these sort of, um, the sort of literary geniuses, if you like. And so what we find is that from this point onward, especially in Florence, but in the other Italian cities, that school teachers, scholars, um, even lawyers, all of whom, of course, came from the merchant middle class, followed in the footsteps of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. That is to say, they began to study and teach the, uh, the poets 
uh, the philosophers, the historians of the Romans and the Greeks. So a veritable movement developed in Florence and in the other Italian cities to revive the literature, the philosophy, and the thought of Rome and Greece. And this movement was facilitated by the development, the invention of the printed book, because with the printed book, you could basically print all of the works of the authors of the ancient world. From 1450 onwards, uh, printing presses quickly established themselves in the major Italian cities of Germany, eventually in France, England, Spain, and so on. And uh, um, one of the, uh, 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 well, this genre of printing the works of Plato, of Cicero, Seneca, uh, these, uh, this is, these were the earliest printed books, we can say. Now, the culture of the humanists, what they, they uh, spoke about in terms of uh, their values were quite different from the values espoused by um, uh, the Middle Ages. The culture of the Middle Ages was essentially religious, dominated by the church. Thinking of the afterlife was the preoccupation of the culture of the Middle Ages. Being a good little boy or girl in order to get into heaven was what it was all about. But also, um, of course, the feudal violent nobil nobility were also uh, fundamental to the Middle Ages. So what you get uh, is amongst the, uh, the culture of the nobles was basically what was admired was courage, bravery, and war, but also loyalty to your superior. That is to say, if you were a knight, a feudal knight, you were loyal to your baron or to your duke. So bravery and loyalty were the fundamental uh, um, values of the nobility. So religion, thinking about the afterlife, or bravery and loyalty, the feudal knights, the feudal class, though that was the culture of the ancient world, uh, of, the, of the medieval world. But the humanists, and I mentioned, I put some of the names of some of the more famous ones. They were all Florentines living in the 15th century. Bruni Salutate Valla, uh, I'm just dropping names here. Um, they had a different culture because for them, they, they much more valued uh, not the afterlife, but this life. Um, they were much more oriented to having a good life in this world rather than the other world, which is very different from that of the church. And that took uh, even the form, the church in its teaching in the Middle Ages basically said that the accumulation of wealth uh, was basically a sin. Caring about uh, accumulating a lot of money um, uh, was bad because you're supposed to think about life in the next world, not in this world. Um, but the humanists said, no, um, uh, accumulating wealth is actually a good thing. You could do a lot of good things, even virtuous things, if you have a lot of money. Um, and so that's the fundamental departure. Furthermore, in the Middle Ages, um, sort of being a loyal member of the church or being a loyal member of the feudal class, following your, your superior lord, being a loyal member of the feudal hierarchy. But no, the humanist said, no, people should be free. They are uh, individually free. They, they stressed individualism as against the group, whereas the church um, 
and even Aristotle, who was um, was uh, valued by the church, taught the idea of the importance the individual has to su subordinate himself, subordinate himself to the society. But the humanists began to teach that no, the pursuit of personal ambition, money, personal ambition, realizing your individual self. Plus they, they talked about, they redefined a sort of rationality. Rationality was not some sort of abstract philosophy. Rationality was a practical approach to the real problems in the world, having a practical approach. And finally, these humanists said that, you know, um, uh, in all of this um, is a new kind of virtue. Individualism, the pursuit of money and so on, um, uh, um, uh, this practical rationality, because um, above all, if you're going to be loyal to anything, um, you have to be loyal to the state, to the state. Loyalty to the state became a virtue, what we call civic, civic virtue. Uh, that, that's the basic attitude. And uh, I'm going to uh, um, be ending off here. Not only did they espouse this new kind of, well, I would say it's a morality, which is above all the morality and the, and the mentality of the merchant class in these Italian city-states, but they also began to criticize the church and above all the Pope. And they said the Pope, um, the Popes, and it was true, um, the Popes, were they they spoke one way about the afterlife and so on, but the Pope and Church and the Church, as a matter of fact, had accumulated vast wealth and they wanted more, and they wanted political power, and they were promoting what uh, the humanists began to denounce as a kind of superstitious superstitious religion to deceive the common people. Well, we'll see how these themes develop into what we refer to as the Reformation, the revolt against the Catholic Church next time.